Hey, this is Alexa Schreiber from Schwartz and & Schreiber, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, The Business Side of Music, with your host and a true legend in his own mind, Bob Bender. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. It sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Here in the studio today, Nashville, Tennessee, very, very special guest. We've actually have... um, been setting this one up a while. He's originally from Israel. He now migrates between New York and Miami. I got that right? That's right. Uh, He is the CEO and founder of Duetti, which is a music financing platform founded in 2022 with the mission of providing quick and easy access to catalog sales for a wide range of musical artists. Their platform helps artists receive up to $400,000 for their tracks, utilizing data-driven prices for established master tracks, allowing artists to sell individual tracks or even parts thereof. While Duetti then markets those tracks using very unique ROI-focused techniques. In 2024, the company announced a $90 million in new funding, bringing its total raise to over $120 million in just 18 months' inception. Lior Tibon, did I say that right? Exactly right. Okay. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. One of the questions we always like to ask our guests when they first come on the show is, Obviously, you're in the music business. Is that something you started out to do initially? Uh, were you a musician or just a music lover? How did, how did this all come about? Not at all, to be honest. I, I stumbled on it. Um, I started my career in a, in a fairly traditional corporate manner uh, in finance. And so right after I graduated, um, I was in London at the time. Uh, I joined uh, an investment bank, Deutsche Bank, and I was there for over five years working on mergers and acquisitions and financing transactions. And at the time, that was the late 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, As you may recall, music was in a very different place to where it is today. And I got to work on a number of uh, situations involving music companies that were semi-distressed, as we call it, in finance. So they were going through some difficulties because everything that was going on uh, in the industry. And then through that, I got connected to people in the space. And ultimately, I got my first job in music, uh, working for uh, Jay-Z and Rock Nation, his company, uh, starting to set up Tidal, the music streaming service he founded. When you talk about music businesses being distressed. We all pretty much know why that happened and how it happened. And your perspective, your personal perspective, how do you think it affected some music businesses more than others? Wow, that's a, that's a very good question. So I would say, um, you know, going through my experience at the time, the, the kind of the early 2010s, Um, Of course, the big um, shift there was this migration from kind of declining revenues and the shift from physical to then downloads and ultimately into streaming, which took really a decade, right, for the industry to fully recover and kind of going back to the level of the same level of revenue that it used to be. And so to your question, how did it affect companies? I think we've seen a lot of companies that have not been able to cope and navigate the transition, right? And so they've um, ultimately got bought by other companies or went out of business. 
uh, because they didn't have maybe the foresight to set the right systems in place in order to accept and fully embrace and exploit uh, the streaming revolution. Other companies were actually very savvy, right? And were able to kind of identify that wave earlier on and ride it in a very successful fashion um, into what we see today. When we talk about that, are we focusing mainly on record labels or was it publishing houses or was there one that stood out more than others? So, so it's both, but I think um, at the time, um, the, the most kind of distressed situations that I observed was actually more on the record label side uh, versus the publishing. Um, maybe it's more of, it's, it's just a more of a kind of a ups and downs business, right? Heat driven, at least at the time. It's different now and we'll probably talk about it uh, more. Um, and so, so the record labels were particularly affected, I think, with all this dislocation and that was happening in the industry. Publishing companies were also affected, but because uh, the revenue is a lot more um, diversified, I think they were able to kind of uh, ride the, the storm uh, in a bit of uh, a, a bit better. Were the financial institutions taking a look at everything that was going on with a little bit of wariness or concern at that time? With a lot of wariness and okay. concern, yes. And so there were a lot of situations that um, companies went through what we call in finance a fire sale, right? And so they had to sell themselves for a very low price, maybe because the company that took on debt to finance that music company put pressure to sell at no matter what cost. And so the overall, I think it took, you know, the finance industry, sometimes it takes a few years to catch up to kind of the frontline trends of what we're seeing in specific industries. And I think here there was no exception. It took a while for financial players to really embrace and understand the financial implications, the positive implications of uh, music streaming into the music industry. So let's fast forward on to the company Duetti. Yeah. And that being a music financing platform, was that created for the labels and the publishing houses or was it also for the artist? Mostly for the artists, mostly for the artists. And so uh, Duedi really was created after we've observed that more and more artists are releasing music independently, right? And so sometimes they do it completely DIY and they work with one of the DIY distribution companies. In other cases, they may work with a, with um, a partner, uh, but it's not, but they would still own the rights themselves and, and kind of uh, uh, go through that in that way. And so what we've seen is that, you know, there is the, the artists themselves are building assets, if you wish, right? Also from a financial perspective, the catalogs that are keep getting streamed over and over again, there is a long term value, financially speaking, right? In addition to the creative value. And so it's there is an opening here to provide an alternative form of financing to the artists that own those rights by virtue of them selling part of those and effectively monetizing uh, parts of their catalogs for, for cash. Is that something that we've been seeing going on with the likes of uh, Neil Young and Stevie Nicks and, and, and those types of art, legacy acts, legacy artists who have these deep catalogs? Exactly. And so, and so the trend started, um, um, well, it started a long time ago, but it really, I think, took off I would say over the last five or six years, um, I think once uh, everyone got comfortable with streaming and the financial uh, financial um, implications of that became more and more clear, we've seen those big legacy acts that you mentioned and many others selling their catalogs for millions and millions of dollars. And so what we're doing at Duetti, we're saying the same way that an kind of a, a top A-list artist is can do that for 10 million, 100 million, hundreds of millions of dollars, we can open up that opportunity to many more artists. Maybe they're not as established, maybe they haven't been around for that long, but the concept is the same concept. They've built a catalog, um, a body of work that people kind of keep coming back to. As a result of that, you can predict the revenue and the financial aspect of that catalog over the long term, and therefore you can put a price on it and, and offer the opportunity to sell. How deep of a catalog do you look at it? We talk about those A-list legacy artists. At some point, that food chain's going to run out. And, and now you're going to have to 
at some point start looking at that next level of artist. How deep of a catalog does that need to be to interest a company such as Duetti? Yeah, and so what we what we publicly say, and so we have two key uh, qualification criteria. One is the length of time, so it's two years. And so, you, so we, we can look and we can make an offer on music that's been out there on streaming services for at least two years. And so, uh, and of course, can go a lot longer than that. The second criteria is size. And so we, we do need a minimum size um, in order to kind of come up with the right pricing approach. And so our what we say is that we the individual tracks in the catalog, the minimum should really be half a million streams per year across all platforms. And so that's really the minimum, I would say, from an age and size perspective, but it can go um, significantly upwards and older as well. When we talk about a half million streams, that's achievable, I think, by some artists, but that can also be a challenge for others. For sure. And so, and so look, we, we need to start somewhere. And so we do believe that uh, those criteria open up the opportunity to work with Duetti for over 100,000 artists worldwide. And so we think it's pretty impactful and significant uh, for a lot of people out there. Uh, with that being said, no doubt that there's many more artists that have uh, music available that is not there just yet. And so we, we will look in the future into potentially even opening up the Apple tool further. And also as they, um, as the artists themselves gain more notoriety and, and, and continue to press their career forward, there may be an opportunity to work with us as they just get more streams. We're going to take a break, get a word in for a couple of our sponsors to help pay the bills around here. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Leo Tebone. You're listening to the business side of music. Branding. What is it really? It goes by many names. Marketing, licensing, and image. When in reality, it's seven key branding formulas that all need to harmonize perfectly. Mess up just one formula and you have compromised the whole brand build. Dead Horse Branding facilitates all seven formulas under one roof, building, promoting, and marketing all brands at all different stages of their level. We are a marketing team's dream, and we were built to service talent, artist managers, record labels, independent artists, iconic brands, legacy estates, and startups. Rooted in music and seated across other industries like fashion, various talent, hospitality, authors, interior designers, lifestyle brands, and corporate entities. The seven branding formulas do not discriminate. Seven branding formulas, all in one swift movement. Sick of beating that dead horse? Come to Dead Horse. Please visit us at deadhorsebranding.com or send us an email to info at deadhorsebranding.com. Are you a fan of 80s and 90s country? Then check out Throwback Country Music, a weekly nationwide show hosted by me, Rick Jones. I have exclusive interviews with legends and icons that include Grammy Award winners and Grand Ole Opry stars. You can listen to the show wherever you get your podcast or watch it on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. For more info and access to these options, visit our website at throwbackcountrymusic.com. That's throwbackcountrymusic.com. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, Lior Tibone is joining us across the podcast table, who is the CEO and co-founder of Duetti, which is a music financing platform. Now, when we talk about music financing, that takes on a lot of different connotations these days. How does Duetti separate itself from other music financing platform, so to speak. Sure. And so we, what we do is we buy catalogs, right? And so we believe that we're maybe the only player that does that at scale for, for artists kind of across the board. I think there's a lot of other companies out there that offer various other financing solutions, for example, advances, um, whether it's for future uh, releases, whether it's for the back catalogs, other type of lending arrangements, right? And so that works can work really well for some people, but we believe that uh, our option is an alternative. And so as an artist, or as a creator, you can kind of consider the pros and cons. Ultimately, there will be certain ramifications uh, if you go down one route versus the other route. I think one of the most important things for me to, to highlight here is the work that we do not just on the financing piece, 
but also on the management and the marketing of the catalog once we uh, partner on a catalog with yourselves. And uh, what does that mean? You know, if a company gives you out, gives out a loan or a short-term kind of advance arrangement, of course, they're limited in terms of the resources that they can deploy in order to really support the distribution and the marketing of that catalog. With us, yes, we, we acquire tracks, at, at least part of a tracks for the long term for uh, outright. But the, the flip side of that is that we're able to invest a lot in our own um, resources uh, in the management and the marketing of the catalog that really helps push it forward. And that in turn provides an advantage not only for if you have a, a stake, direct financial direct benefit, but also um, just increasing the overall artist profile uh, in the community. When you talk about buying the catalogs, does that transfer the ownership from the artist to Duetti, or do they still have a piece of the pie? So the, yes, we, we do buy the ownership itself, okay. uh, but they can retain, as I said, they can retain an income uh, stake in the catalog or in individual tracks of up to 50%. So it could be a 50-50 deal, or it could be a whole deal, but we do buy the ownership outright, yes. Does that work for, let's say, an artist who's been on a label for years, has been able to purchase their publishing, they're now on their own. D does that work in their favor? It really depends, right? So yeah. the way we look at it is that we provide an option and if you choose, you can take it. And if no, that's perfectly fine. Um, we're seeing in most cases, artists that work with us are artists that um, really release, are releasing music independently, right? So they're not coming out of a label arrangement. They started out, or at some point, maybe they were on a label, but then they, they started to go on the independent route. They own the masters themselves, and so they decided that's something that can work for them. Talking about independent artists, one of the things I noticed in the pre-show notes is that your company has come out with a music economics report. Let's dig into that a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. What is that all about? And I'm assuming that that helps the independent artists these days? Yeah, that's the, that's the intention. And so what we, what we thought right when we started the company is that one of the big benefits of being operating in the market is just to provide more transparency around the economics of music. We're seeing a lot of reporting and a lot of conversation in the industry around the, the top charts and, and kind of streaming numbers and kind of all of those type of things. But I think it's very difficult to then make sense of it all and translate it into dollars and cents, right? That's what we're doing, right? So in, on the one side, if you're talking to us, we may just give you various different price proposals on the catalog, which is a, one way of putting a financial number around your uh, music activity. Another side is really, as you say, to publish kind of public reporting to help people make sense of it all and understand, okay, if I'm making X amount of millions of streams on YouTube or on Spotify or on Apple Music, what does it actually mean for my income this year, next year, and so on and so forth? Because I would think that the numbers, when we talk about economics, are going to be different on YouTube than they are on Spotify, than they are on Apple Music. So is, is, does this report take a deep dive into all of that and, and really kind of put the spotlight on it and show what, what actually is being there to achieve, to be able to expect? Absolutely. And so, and so if you dive into our report, the full report is available on our website, on the press section, on duety.co. Uh, you will see that there is a lot of very granular detail uh, on kind of the nuts and bolts financial numbers behind those those streaming uh, figures. And so we, for example, we break down and it's very clear that uh, there's a very big difference between what Apple, for example, is paying, which is a on the high end um, from the big uh, streaming platforms versus Spotify, which is kind of in the middle or, or maybe towards the, towards the low end, right? And so uh, you can kind of start dissecting, right, your numbers and to understand, okay, I have this level of kind of headline streaming, but exactly to your point, it, it means different things to different people depending on the composition of the platforms that are the most important for you, uh, 
It also very much depends on, for example, the geographies where you're very uh, popular in, right? And so we're really trying to kind of dig a lot deeper and trying to, to make sense of it all. So when we talk about the geography of all of this, is, is it different for a, a U.S.-based artist than it is for an artist, say, maybe in France or England or Germany or we start getting into the pan-Pacific nations. Are, are those numbers always going to be different? Or, or is there just one, I don't want to say wholesale number, but, but there's not a basic number, is there? There isn't. Okay. There isn't. Uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. So, yes. Yeah, so, the short answer is it will be different. And the reason is, number one, there's specific pricing dynamics in each market. So, in the U.S., obviously, we're paying in dollars. There's, certain, uh, there's a certain price for music subscriptions in the U.S. In the U.K., for example, it's in pounds. So, that's a different kind of currency translation. And so, that really depends on just the retail pricing of the streaming services, right? Another example would be Brazil. Brazil, for example, where the pricing is, is just a lot lower in dollar terms because it's just a different uh, market dynamics that they have over there, right? And so that kind of the, ge the geographical aspect is really, really important. The second uh, important piece, as we've talked about already, is which platform is the most important and also uh, where do you stream the most on which specific tier of a platform? Because if you stream really well on Spotify, but on the free tier, of Spotify for whatever reason, right? Maybe because you have more of younger audiences that they haven't, they're not paying yet or whatever the reason may be, that will translate to a lot, a lot less money in your pocket versus if you stream really well in Apple on individual plans, for example. So you need to kind of go, go very, a lot deeper into kind of the, not only the geographical structure, but the structure of the streaming platforms that uh, where you're very popular and also specifically within each platform, which kind of sub tier and kind of a plan uh, your audience is on. When we talk about the last 10, 15, 20 years and the music industry really kind of catching up to the, the, the change of platforms. We've gone from hard product, which was originally vinyl and then CD cassettes were in there at some point to digital downloads. And now we're talking about streaming. That's kind of been uh, soft ground, so to speak. It hasn't really been something firm for the music industry to, to put a foot on. And, and build a foundation. Is that starting to change? Are we seeing the delivery of music maybe staying in the status quo of streaming now? Although vinyl is coming back, it is, and I think CDs to a certain point. Are, are we seeing something in the horizon that is really going to kind of upset the music business again? Well, that's, that's a question that I think uh, a lot of people are asking themselves. <laughs> I think, I think, look, if you're looking at the dynamics of streaming, there's still, in my opinion, a lot of room to grow. Oh. Um, in particular, in outside kind of the North American, uh, European markets, right, as it comes to Latin America, so when it comes to certain areas in Asia, other places, there's a lot of room to grow still in terms of monetization uh, and paid streaming plans, right? And so we're not over that cycle just yet. I think the next piece is people definitely are asking themselves and, and kind of asking um, loudly, okay, it's what's next. Um, there is a conversation, as, as I'm sure you're aware, around the super fans, right? And how do we distinguish between folks that are only paying, quote unquote, 11 bucks a month, for example, on their streaming plan versus folks that frankly will be very comfortable to pay double that uh, maybe. Uh, but of course, you need to also differentiate and provide more, right? And so, and that's something that I think you know, the industry is still struggling with, right? Like how to, you know, upsell, right? How to, how to provide more value at higher price points at scale. It's something that's still not there. I think there's a lot of companies and people that are trying to come up with various creative ideas. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. We're going to take another break, get another word in for a couple more of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Leo Tibon. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Mark Allen Barnett, singer, songwriter, creative coach, and mentor. Are you an artist or songwriter or a family member or friend of someone who is? Are you trying to find your way through the often confusing world of today's music business? I'm here to help. 
Over the past 40 years, I've written and recorded hit songs, have had more than my share of live performances, and have seen the ups and downs of the music industry and what Music City, also known as Nashville, has to offer. I'm here to share that information with you. The Mark Allen Barnett Songwriting Tours of Nashville are a one-day to multi-day private interactive workshops developed to help you discover your best approach to songwriting, performing in front of a live audience, along with the correct way to network within the music industry. Our workshops are based around what you need to know. While in Nashville, you get an insight from behind the scenes, learn about the history of Music City, separate fact from fiction, and give yourself or a loved one the time of your life. This workshop makes the perfect gift for someone you love who wants to get their foot in the door of the music business the right way. For more information, go to www.markallenbarnett.com or www.musicchoosesyou.com. Remember, you don't choose music. Music chooses you. As a musician, you have a dream. That vision of what success looks like for you. Though it's not only about the money, money is a part of it. Whether you've been extremely successful or just striving to maintain a regular cash flow, you need a plan. Money Concepts can help you develop a customized plan to achieve the financial stability and success you want. For over 40 years, Money Concepts has been providing holistic financial planning services to individuals, families, and business owners. As an independent firm, Money Concepts and their associates are committed to always represent the best interest of the client. It's really about independence coupled with committed benevolent interest which means that they can represent your client, not a product supplier. It's not about selling products. It's about helping you achieve success. To learn how this can benefit you, contact John Adams at 737-867-9309. That's 737-867-9309 for more information. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, we always appreciate when our guests come in from all over the world, and, and Lear Tubone is no different. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned that originally, uh, before you were the uh, co-founder and CEO of your company, you were also the COO of Tidal. Was that really the beginning of this footprint that you've created with your company now? Well, I would say that was a lot, a, a lot before we we started Duetti, but um, definitely, you know, that was my first um, kind of uh, entrance into the music industry, and I've learned a lot as it comes to um, how music creators, musical artists, think about kind of the 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 music economy in what sense it works for them, in what sense it doesn't, the whole kind of relationships between technology companies, uh, record labels, and other kind of content owners and the musicians themselves. And I think by being in those rooms and by having those kind of conversations for many, many years, that ultimately what uh, gave me the right context to set up Duetti a couple of years ago. Let's talk about Duetti and how uh, an artist, someone who's got that catalog that fits your criteria, how do they approach the company? How do they start that conversation? Sure. So we're we're always on the lookout for for conversations and for talking to people and explain uh, what we're all about. Um, it's very simple. You we have a website and you can simply go there, um, and there's an there's an email uh, on the website and simply send an email, and usually within a day or two, uh, you will get a call back from from one of our team members. And they're going to start a conversation with you to explore whether there is a potential uh, fit here, right? Before they do that, though, the, the artist really needs to do their homework and have a basic understanding of what the value of their catalog is. Yes, absolutely. I think I would say the first and f the first kind of point of of that you probably want to check is whether you kind of qualify the minimum criteria, right? As I laid out before in this conversation, at least two years, at least half a million streams a year. Uh, if you do have, if you do kind of uh, have that, as it comes to the question of value, it's of course a very complicated question, right? And we, re we recognize that there is a financial value, there is a creative value, there is the value to you, there is a value to an investor, and so it can get convoluted, right? All we can do, and what we're trying to do every day in all of our conversations, is to have a very clear explanation into how we come up with our own financial figures why is it like that 
in some cases, people are very comfortable with the numbers we give them. In other cases, they may be, may, maybe they're surprised. And all we can say is really to come up with a clear, a transparent explanation. And as I said before, our deals are structured in a way, it's, it's, it's a transactional kind of contract. And so it's really up to you if you want to go into it or not. We're not putting any additional burden on you beyond doing the deal itself. You don't have to continue to be in business with us for the next X amount of years. And so we're trying to create a very flexible, a kind of fair approach and just another data point for you to consider. The catalog that you purchase as the artist grows, as they assimilate more music on the streaming platforms and, and that growth potential, is that something that gets absorbed immediately into the catalog that you purchase or is that something you look at separately? Not immediately. And so it's it's completely under your the artist's control what you want to do with it, right? And so we you're in the driving seat. What I would say is that, of course, we would love to continue the dialogue and the conversation. In fact, back in February, when we announced, as you said at the beginning of the call, uh, the $90 million of new funding that we got, we also announced that out of 250 artists that transacted with us at the time, and partner with us on 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 catalog tracks, over fifteen percent of them uh, within the just over a year that we've been in business came back for a second or third deal, and so we're very proud of that uh, statistic because that's really what we aspire to be. Right? We wanna we want you, the artist, to decide. We're not compelling you. It's, you're in the driving seat, but we want you to decide to come back to us as you grow your career for us to be almost like a capital and management and marketing partner for you as you build your assets uh, into the long term. I, I want to get off course here for a minute, if you don't mind. One of the biggest topics of conversation in the music industry in the last few years has been this behemoth that we call Taylor Swift and, and what what she's done, she's literally turned the music industry inside out uh, with some of her, what I would consider very smart, business-minded moves. Do you see another artist on the horizon that may step into those shoes uh, within the near or distant future? Because, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I just want to get your opinion. She seems to be a bit of a standalone right now. She does. I agree with you. You know, I would say as an overall observation, right? I don't know, of course, uh, there will be, uh, as there always have been and, and will be uh, kind of, you know, breakout success stories, which is great and, and, and kind of it's good to observe. But overall, right, taking a step back, I think we're seeing a more and more diverse industry, uh, more and more artists that are addressing um, smaller but very committed audiences. And so if I'm looking at the overall kind of market and how it's developing, we're actually seeing less and less of kind of really big kind of household name superstars kind of coming into kind of the public kind of mind. And more and more artists uh, are out there and, and than ever, but they're really addressing more niche uh, audiences, right? And so that's really, to kind of bring it back to Duetti, that's really what why we think Duetti can be very helpful, right? Like when we do not operate as a, rec as a classic record label, that's really looking for the next, maybe not Tyler Swift, but maybe something um, at a very, v uh, maybe an artist that can really be a breakaway success, right? Uh, we think there is another group of artists that is very large and it's increasing every single year that needs financing, needs services, can benefit from more professional uh, partners. And that's where we come into the table. I read an article uh, a few weeks back. Dweezil Zappa, who, was, who is Frank Zappa's son, is talking about how he's literally had to sell some musical instruments to help finance his tour. And he, and he made the comment that, you know, what a lot of people don't realize, especially those in the business, is you don't start making money on, on touring until the end. I, is this something where your company, Duetti, can maybe help offset some of that to where like a, a, a Dweezil Zappa doesn't have to sell, you know, vintage guitars to pay that, that touring, those touring costs? Absolutely. And so that's exactly, I love what you've just said in this example, because that's really one of the use cases we've seen the most, right? An artist is actually having 
um, success, right? They started maybe a few years ago. They're working independently. Um, they're doing well. They want to now go on tour. They want to record a new album and go to a really professional studio. They have other other business needs, right, that just require capital. And so what they could do is maybe they can go and do a classic record label deal, right? And, you know, uh, make an arrangement for the future X amount of releases that they have. So that's definitely an option. Another option could be they can use the assets from the past, that it's a loss, a lot less, I would say, you know, kind of under consideration what are, uh, how much money they're making and what they're worth and work with a company like ours. And we can then provide them a significant check for that. Um, and they can then use it for the tool for a new recording that we they will then completely own themselves for the future, right? And so it's just a different way of thinking about the economics of it all and how you can leverage your past assets into a future success. I believe you mentioned it once before, but let's get it again. The website and the email where they can go to contact you. Yeah, so duetti.co. That's our website, and there's a button there for, for contact us. It, it's contact at duetti.co, and we're um, available, and, and we have a team. We, we have a kind of an a and team, right, that they work with artists um, kind of day in, day out, uh, very experienced folks in the industry. They're based uh, in Los Angeles, New York, other places, and they're you know, just looking for the right connections and the right conversations. And we'll make sure to in- incorporate that into our show notes. Here's a shout out to our loyal listeners. Without all of you, and I mean it, all of you, we wouldn't be one of the most listened to music industry interview podcasts. I love sharing this because it's it's folks like you, the listener of the show, that help us achieve being number one status in many countries around the world, according to Apple Podcasts. And hey, look, folks, they're the holy grail when it comes to the podcast business. If you enjoy our show, please check out our Facebook page at The Business Side of Music Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and definitely hit the like button. While you're at it, go to our page on YouTube and click on The Business Side of Music Podcast to subscribe. You can check out our video webcasts there and get to see me and our guests such as Lior here in the studio. Uh, along with Buddy the Music Dog, who my wife, once again, has kenneled up because he just doesn't know how to behave himself around guests. Last but not least, check out and follow us on X. I almost said Twitter, but on X. And you can find us there at Biz Music Podcast. That's B-I-Z Music Podcast. Leo, thank you so much for being on the show. This was great. A lot of information. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.